Hi, I'm Mark Mattioli, and welcome to another reading of Boston Accent. Boston Accent is available on Amazon.com. It it's, uh, contains adult subject matter. It's not for children. We're a couple of days behind here and several hours behind. Uh, so we're going to do back-to-back readings today. It's Today is Creature Double Feature. All right. Let's get right into it. Oh, let me just jot down the time here. Dag it so I know when to stop. Okay. Last minute detail, and we're ready to rock and roll. Boston accent. In the spring of 1978, I met two completely different women and began a relationship with both of them. One, Diana Davis, was a senior at Marlin High. I met her at a party and Marlon through mutual friends. She had to leave the party 15 minutes after I met her. I walked her to her sister's car, who was waiting for her in the driveway, got her phone number, and kissed her goodbye. Within a week, we were a couple and spent nearly every weekend together for the next year. I considered Diana my girlfriend, but when I wasn't with her, I saw other people. It wasn't like I went out looking for them. It just happened. It was during this time period, the summer of 78, that in one week I had physical relations with seven different women. Three of them on the same day. Some of these women knew we weren't exclusive and some of them didn't. Some of them cared and some of them did not. One woman who knew she wasn't the only one and was good with it for a while was also the youngest. And she had just, she had just moved in across the street from me and her name was Angie Skyla. She was 15 to my 21. And we, were, and we told our parents our relationship was strictly platonic because of the large age difference. Angie was also a very beautiful, very innocent virgin when we started our relationship. And although we came close, when, I, when our romance was over, her innocence was intact, like her hymen. We have a great relationship to this day, at least up until this reading, and consider each other close friends. Diana was also a virgin when I met her, and she lost her innocence on the front seat of her mother's impala. The first thing she said when we were done was, Wow, so that was it? I think I like it. Can we do it again? I had created a monster, and now she wanted to mess around 24-7, which can be difficult when you both live with your parents. Diana was a green-eyed blonde of Irish, French-Canadian background, and meeting her dad was one of the most uncomfortable dad meetings I ever had. Her dad was a heavy-drinking barroom brawl type with a nose that had been broken so many times it kind of just laid flat on his face. One day, Diana invited me to, to come over and mess around with her as her family had gone off for the day. She said her dad, Clay, had just got home from a three-month business trip to Columbia. I asked her what he did for work, and she said he was in the mob. I laughed and said, sure he is. She took me by the hand and led me to her parents' bedroom and opened the closet. In the back of the closet on the floor was a shoebox filled with $100,000 in $100 bills for a job he had done transporting bales of weed from Columbia to Maine on a ship. This was his job in the 70s, and he bought his family a new house with his earnings. Everything was great until he got caught in the early 80s and did five years in a federal pen. When he got out of prison, all the money was gone, and he had to find a legitimate way to earn a living. It wasn't until after Clay got out of jail that he and I became friends. I think once he realized he didn't have to look over his shoulder every day, he was able to relax and enjoy life. Before jail, I don't remember ever seeing him smile on the rare occasion that he was home. I always thought he had a problem with me, but now I tend to believe he had a lot of work-related issues on his mind. One night, Diana and I double-dated with Tim Flanagan. 
he and his girlfriend, Becky, and we ended up at a party near the fairgrounds. Tim had been a co-worker on the state job. In addition to being a devout deadhead, he was quite a character. Tim will forever be in my memory as the person that showed me cocaine for the first time. But it wasn't just ordinary coke. It was pink Peruvian flake. Tim had a tiny little amount, and he was showing it off the way a father would show up a picture of his newborn son. He was so proud. I will, will admit I was a little curious, but excitement did not enter into it. He offered me a tiny little, tiny little line to sample of this most precious and fabled drug, and I accepted. The result was absolutely nothing. I played like it was fantastic, uh, for Tim's sake. I would not see cocaine again for five years. I cannot tell you enough how I wish it was longer than that, or not at all. I scored my, per my first professional job in the summer of 78. In my first position that had some relation to my college degree. My job title was audiovisual technician, or AV tech. It was another state job based in Portnoy, where I was hired to produce a documentary on a state-funded program that trained young people and gave them jobs that benefited their communities. These positions could be anything from restoring a historical building to constructing a safe play area in a park for children, and there were hundreds of participants involved, involved in dozens of projects throughout Portnoy, Portnoy County. I was provided with an office, a 35mm camera, a video camera, a mobile video unit in the form of an RV, and a gas card. For someone that was not yet 21, this was huge. It really sent a message to people that knew me, including my family, that despite all my problems, I was for real, and I could be successful earning a living doing something I enjoyed. Basically what I did was get a list of locations of all the projects, arrive at the sites, conduct brief interviews with the participants, and take photographs and video of their work. I would then put the sites on a rotation and return to update their progress. For me, it was the greatest job in the world. However, there were some hiccups along the way. I had never driven anything as mammoth as the RV, and it was a really unnecessary mode of transportation. The first day I drove it, I made the mistake of driving through the center of town during rush hour instead of jumping on the highway. The center of town was a narrow street. The cars parked on both sides. I misjudged my clearance on my passenger side, and my side mirror caught a pickup truck's mirror and shattered it. It happened right in front of a breakfast diner, and a witness stopped and stared at me. I asked them if they knew the owner, and they were pretty sure that they were inside. The traffic started moving, and I pulled, I pulled away and took my first side street so I could park and offer to pay for the mirror. My shit luck took me down a dead-end street. As I pulled in a driveway to turn around, I forgot about the height clearance issue, and a tree branch ripped the cargo rack off the roof. It didn't come completely off the roof, but... but Half the bolts were ripped out, and it was now sticking up in the air like some mangled antenna. This is my first day on the job, mind you. I haven't even made it to my first assignment. I parked at the end of the road and into the diner, asking for the owner of the pickup, and no one responded. I returned to the RV, wrote a note apologizing for the damage with my phone number, and I left it under the windshield wiper. I never got a call. One thing I must mention for for those of you who are assuming I can't drive for shit is is uh, is that I can't follow along in my own book either. Uh, <laughs> uh, besides this incident and wrecking my mother's car, well, shit faced, and one other incident while driving in a employee's vehicle, th those aside, I didn't have another accident for 30 years. The others were just shit, bad luck, and freak occurrences out of my control.
find that, right? The other incident I didn't mention while driving an employer's vehicle happened while working for Victory Enterprises. I was employed at the parents' castle for the day. The mother gave me a list of items she needed picked up in town. She insisted I use her vehicle, which was a large station wagon, right off the set of the movie Vacation. I made it into town, picked up all the items as asked, and as I arrived back at the castle, I pulled up to the large stone wall that separated the driveway from the moat. Had there, had there been a moat. I'm coming up the driveway at a good clip, and when I go to move my foot from the gas to the brake, my work boot sticks up under an extended dashboard in the form of an air conditioning unit, and I hit the wall hard. Oops. It was a loud crash, and the mother came out to see what had happened. She was pissed. Didn't ask me if I was okay, and when they got the estimates for the repairs, I was given a copy. I was not asked to pay. It was more like a dog having his face rubbed in a mess he has made He has made in the house. There were, there were, these people were multi-millionaires, I must remind you. I read a story in the paper some years later that one of the sons had bought their next-door neighbor's oceanfront home for $3 million and then leveled it and left it an empty lot because they felt it was an eyesore. We're on the same page now about this family? Yeah, okay. The following week, when I reported to the castle, I parked along the castle wall where the guests parked as opposed to parking at the end of the quarter-mile drive as I had been instructed on day one. There were never any guests when I was there and I was hungover and I did not feel like walking. As soon as I was inside, the mother pointed to my car and said, you know your car doesn't belong there, so get it out of there and move it where it belongs and make it quick. I moved it where it belonged all right, which is back on the road and headed home, which was my second choice after upper ass. Enough was enough. I received a phone call from, from the son with a cheating wife and, and I confirmed I would not be back and I appreciated him mailing me my last check. Meanwhile, back in the RV, I returned to the office parking lot early after my first day of misadventure. I was just killing some time listening to the radio when the announcer said Keith Moon the drum for the British band The Who was dead. As if my day hadn't been bad enough. Now the person I consider the greatest drum in the world was gone. It's another, do you remember where you were when someone died scenario for a choice group of Who fans? Kennedy, I have no idea. Keith Moon, sitting in an RV with a luggage rack ripped off in Portnoy. My supervisor came out to the RV to ask me how my first day was, and his eyes went up to the roof and back to me and said, I hope it doesn't rain, and then he walked away. I guess he thought I ripped the whole roof off. After that, the only other incident was, was with a work release inmate who was doing general maintenance during the day and had to be back to the jail by a certain time. He was considered low risk and was scheduled to be paroled in a matter of months. He approached me one day and asked me if I had any weed. I must have looked the type or else he saw the RV roof rock. I ate weed on me, as I usually did during this period of my life, and he took me into the maintenance shed where we get high. Afterwards, I said goodnight and headed home. The next day, I didn't see him around. I asked for him to the person he reported to and was told he was late reporting back to lockup and his work release status had been revoked. Apparently, after he left me, he decided a nice cold beer would go good right, now, right about now. And one turned to two and then three, and he lost track of time. I mentioned what happened to a friend, and he shook his head and said, You're a bad influence. That nickname stuck, and I wear that name tag still. In the fall, there was an investigation into a misappropriation of funds with a direct link to my manager, and the whole program dissolved out from under me. I hadn't even finished putting together my documentary and hours and hours of film footage and hundreds of still photos on my desk. My supervisor said, thanks for your effort. Maybe we can use this to save our jobs. 
by the end of the year, the building was empty. Okay, we're going to end it right there. And then I'm going to come back shortly. We're going to do a second segment. All right? I'm Mark Mattioli. I'm reading Boston Accent. Ciao.